everyone. Welcome to BYOB, the Bring Your Own Book podcast. I'm Nikki. And I'm Kelly. And today we have a very, very special guest with us. One of my favorite authors, number one New York Times and USA Today bestselling author, Maureen Johnson. She's here with us today to talk about her latest standalone mystery novel that was released on August 6th, The Death at Morning House. Welcome, Maureen. Thank oh you goodness. for having me. We have similar fuzzy microphones. Yes. <laughs> mm. I keep meaning to put googly eyes on this, just on this side. So, oh my yeah, I feel like that, that would, would really so make great. it. Yeah. <laughs> you'd have to name him too, or her, or that. Ferbert, you'd have to name the mic. <laughs> I just thought of that name, but that's what he's going to be, Ferbert. I like and it. that what it shall be. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, thank you again so much for coming today. Before we dive into questions related to Death at Morning House, I wanted to touch on the organization that you're a part of, Authors Against Book Banning. This is a super cool organization. We just want to know, and we want everybody listening to know, how did you become involved in the organization as a co-leader, and what is the organization doing? Well, I am thrilled to be asked. Thank you. So Authors Against Book Banning is a nationwide American organization I was asked uh, by the National Committee to be the co-chair of New York and Connecticut, along with Maris Kreitzman, who's an amazing journalist and writer. Um, it, we have an epidemic of book banning in the United States. Um, I don't know if you've heard, but we have some weird stuff going on here. And uh, I don't know if you've heard about it at all. It's, uh, you know, <laughs> I don't know if you've heard that sometimes things get a little, uh, a little shifty here. Um, <laughs> But it's in response to the epidemic of book banning. I personally, I have a long experience with book banning. I have had, actually my bannings were quite some time ago where it started with me. Um, it's a surreal experience. The first thing you learn is that book banners don't read. They do not read. They do not read the things they ban. Um, so for example, one morning I saw my book on I think it was Fox and Friends in the morning in somewhere in Florida. And these women are being interviewed. And there's a picture of my book with triple X under it. I'm like, what is happening? What is happening right now? And they're saying all these things. I'm like, none of these things are in the book. But the thing is, I know. I wrote it. Like, I wrote it. Uh, but sometimes they object to things that aren't in it. Sometimes they, they very selectively read. They just have a list of stuff they don't like and they personally don't want and therefore they have decided through their infinite wisdom of not reading anything that nobody will be allowed to read these things um you're always this is a movement entirely driven by non-readers and attention seekers that is all that it's ever been about is attention seeking behavior um so we need to fight back because these things are being codified and also it's getting violent uh there are librarians teachers media specialists people are being threatened they're being threatened for everything from firing to physical violence i way even way back i had two librarians lose their job over my books so wow. uh these sexy books that have no sex in them right like <laughs> right it's it's surreal but that's how it happens um you know it's we're here as a resource to help librarians media specialists teachers anybody who's or legislators um who needs you know we need an author we need somebody to come and talk at a school board meeting we need this information we need we're trying to get feedback on this piece of legislation we just need support can you show up can you talk that's what this is about it's right. new it's still kind of getting it we're getting feet on our on the ground but we are having success in the new york chapter we've been working on uh, the case of a bunch of books that were found in the garbage with um, stickies on them that said why they were unacceptable and why they had been binned. Um, you usually find when you drill down that most book bannings and book eliminations are driven by only, say, one or one member of the community. You know, you'll find that this one person has been like, I have a thing. I've given up on Pilates and now my new thing <laughs> is getting on TV, removing uh. books from libraries. Um, that's really all it ever is. I mean, truly, I've been, I've seen this for a long time and it's always that. It's always that. And then it's a cause and then it becomes a talking point and then it just kind of turns into this sort of geode of like 
this is this is bad for kids and then you'll turn it you know and then it just becomes a rock that gets thrown around in legislation and in and politics so that's a very long-winded answer but if anybody's written a book please join us authors against book banning it's a very easy sign up form and if you are an author uh sorry well if you're an author but you're an educator librarian anybody who's like i need help books being banned in my library i need support or whatever reach out to us they have we have branches all around america i i don't I'm not sure if you have, I'm embarrassed to say I don't know what the Canadian situation is. I don't know if it's very similar. Um, I think it's a little similar, but the one of the main problems I find living in Canada is a lot of it is swept under the rug. Mm. So I work at a bookstore as a bookseller and I did like half of a library program in school. So we talked about it a bit, but like in Canada, I think there are definitely some books that are banned, but you don't really hear about it. And then we have like a national book month or like book banning week awareness kind of thing. See, I don't even know what it's called because we right. don't really talk about it. Um, and it'll like highlight a few titles, usually by Canadian authors, but they were banned and now they're not. But there's just like no education about it. And yeah, so like I couldn't, I think it's a little less um like newsworthy i guess right now versus like what's going on in the states but it definitely still happens here and it's usually like the same titles over and over um but yeah i don't know nikki if you have anything to add i think that's my experience with it yeah i mean i don't i don't really know i like it's been a long time since i've been in school but i took like AP English classes and we were allowed to read whatever we wanted mm -hmm. we didn't have any kind of like jurisdiction put on us about like what books we weren't allowed to study from I know mm -hmm. when my mom was a kid there were a lot of banned books but she went to a private school and so they still taught them um oh but yeah I don't think that it's as prevalent in Canada I know that um, in the states, like down south, there's a lot about mm -hmm. um, like books about queer people and stuff, and like not wanting kids in school to read about that or that being like a very polarizing subject. And that's not something that we deal with here so much. I find like the Canadian government works really hard to make Canada as inclusive as possible. And so that's not something that's really trickled up here so much. It's really strange how this is all so way back, you know, when I, I did a thousand jobs when I was coming, you know, I was writing and I was also, you know, doing a thousand jobs to pay the rent. And I was a textbook. I, my specialty was textbooks. I was I it was one of those things where you get a job and they're like, do you know how to do this? And I'm, I said, yes. I said, yes, always like you're going to give me a job. I'm like, I I definitely know how to steer ships like I. I it's, yeah. <laughs> A hundred percent, I know how to fly a plane. Oh boy! Uh oh. <laughs> um, but I was a textbook editor, and my specialty—I got very good at it—was correlating textbooks to all these various. Every state in America has a set of standards, and mm -hmm. in order to sell a textbook, you had to correlate it to all these state standards. I had memorized them. I was like a walking database of these, and I could correlate books. Like in my sleep, I could be like, "Here's your Pennsylvania correlation. Here's your Tennessee correlation." But we used to have to correlate. Is this sounds a little technical, but there are you knew for example you would get these lists of content guides and there were all of these things that it, that you couldn't have and that you knew you couldn't have in the textbook or it wouldn't sell to florida it wouldn't sell to tennessee it wouldn't sell wherever uh so we always knew you could never have dinosaurs like dinosaurs were always a no-go yeah you couldn't have dice um because that was gambling so everything wow. had to be a six-sided number cube wow. i mean the, you, then what? it was like the sublime to the extreme like you always knew i was like dinosaurs and dice every time um but dungeons you, and dragons oh <laughs> oh absolutely not um uh swimming pools like you just coffee uh there was oh, one that was literally just off. there was one that was just danger there was one that was literally like danger like how many stories about people making community gardens are you going to put in this english textbook like this You're is right. uh so yeah it was textbooks and then i also did um standardized tests and mm -hmm. 
I had this weird specialty that this was my side gig. This was my hustle for maybe six or seven years. And I have all this experience in textbooks and, and testing and seeing how restrictive it was. And one of my last acts was to take the list of things we couldn't have in a textbook. And I sent it to Harper's Magazine. And I was like, here's it. Cause they used to publish all kinds of stuff in the opening, like things. And I was like, you need, and they published it. And they under the, under the heading text for nothing. Like it's, this was just this list of things you couldn't have in there. Wow. And now we have book banning and now we have this, um, this kind of codifying of transphobia, which was weirdly in some ways author driven. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, and then, you know, it, it, uh, especially in the UK, it really that kind of movement came over from the UK in a very in a certain way. Um, and then, you know, they're afraid of drag, drag performers reading to kids. And it's become this rodeo of weirdness here where it's just all these talking points and people now just people like there are there are libraries, there are school libraries and classrooms in Florida right now that have no books in them. Yeah, they have so no. Sad. I want to repeat that. They have no books in them because of the law. I don't know what to I don't know what to say about that. So the, I'm mm -hmm. sorry to I know I'm supposed to be talking about death at Morning House, but I'm like this is much more important. So no, uh, right. yes, I'm very passionate about it. <laughs> Makes well, me so I mad. Think, <laughs> I think I mean Canada is definitely not perfect, but I think one thing is that we have like three main political parties, so it's harder to get a majority right in the house of parliament which is like our senate i guess maybe i'm not a expert <laughs> but yeah so like when it comes to things like we can't teach about dinosaurs some places may feel a little bit like that like some places out west are kind of more like traditional you might say like the south or something but like not really still like we still to my knowledge like we teach about dinosaurs we teach about Evolution, whatever there's other yeah. things that we cover up yeah other things we cover up but like it is harder to push your your singular agenda when there's multiple parties trying to work together in the house to keep it as equal as they can but we're not supposed not to be a duopoly here but we are like that's not it's yeah. not codified that we're a duopoly but we are de facto a duopoly yeah. so yeah. But not for I'm not trying to just make this about I'm not I'm not trying to make this about my book, but that's partially what's that's there. It's dedicated to the librarians and the mm -hmm. booksellers and the teachers that are fighting. But part of what Death at Morning House is about, I'm pretty direct about it, is about covering up, covering up your past and yeah. refusing to tell stories about your past and literally the the elimination of certain parts of history that were that, you know, you're not allowed to teach here. Mm -hmm. Of the things that really happen, there's a lot of stuff in our history that's yes. very bizarre. And the people, people when they hear about it, they're like, well, "I never was taught about that, so it must not be real." Well, no, you weren't taught about it because you weren't taught about it. Like that's it. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, I, that one always gets me when people are like, "Well, it must not be true because I was never taught about it." <laughs> that's not how anything works. <laughs> you just weren't taught about it. You yeah. not knowing doesn't make it fake. Yeah, no. you weren't taught about it because uh, some old white guy probably said, people don't need to know this, and then just yeah. pushed it away. Yeah, none of this is none of this is really, because part of what you find out in the past, there are two narratives in this book, a 1930s one and a present day one, is what this family, this very rich, famous family in the past was into. Mm -hmm. And one of the things they are into, and it comes right up, is eugenics, which was super common, accepted, everyday it wasn't fringe, really. You could yeah. go to state fairs and get a corn dog and then go over to the eugenics tent and get your baby's head measured. There were eugenics tents at state fairs. Ew. And that's what they did. Oh, it's that. It is genuinely. That's not a joke I'm making up. Yeah. That is that is what was happening. It was just like, that's just how it is. That's just how it is. It, uh. pop, we, it pops up. You know, if you've ever. Am I getting too booky? But. If you read The Great Gatsby, Tom Buchanan mentions this. He's like, here's, he's talking about all this incredibly racist stuff and mentioning these books. He's like, this is what's really, all of that was common belief. Like that was, that was basically, that was where people were at. That's what they were accepting as like, this is just, you know, this is just scholarship. This is just, so 
yeah, we don't we don't talk about that. It's just it's here again in another form because we never talk about it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I okay. I want to deep dive into Morning House, but first I got to ask about your other very popular book series, uh, Truly Devious, which Nikki and I both love. We did an episode on the first book, I think, in our first season of the podcast. Yeah, love it so much. And so after, you're welcome, thank you. (laughs) After so many series and the success of Truly Devious, what made you decide to write a standalone mystery in Death at Morning House? Well, first of all, there are more Stevie Bells coming. Stevie Bell 6 has already started. So, yeah, so it wasn't that it stopped. It didn't stop. (laughs) Good. (laughs) No, in fact, here, hold on, I'll take this down. Right here. So this... I'm hold, for the reader, I'm holding up a little, I, I don't want to hold it up too much, but it is a chart. Uh, it's a character proje- progression chart from truly devious right through the last book. And these are all like the, the various notes that um, I have oh. that of what's happening with each character. And this particular chart, uh, do you know, obviously, you know, Holly Black, yes. um, Holly Black, good friend of mine, uh, a genius. She is the person you call at midnight and say, my book is broken. This is, this is really what she's like. And she says, send it to me and call me at four in the morning. And then she reads it. She's also nocturnal. And then she reads it and then she tells you what's wrong. She's, oh my God. she's like a book doctor. She's it's like a professor. A like that. <laughs> no, I mean, Holly, but Holly, and also given the choice, Holly would spend all of her time. We all have, we all have activities we do to not write. Holly's are fixing other people's books and or and she also got me deep into planner culture. Uh, She got deep into planners during COVID. And then when I went to her house, uh, she was like, I need to show you all my planners. So here is the happy planner and here's the Erin Condon. And I'm really into the the vertical layouts, but also the horizontal layout. So she is like a whole plan. She's the one that gave me this this um, this pencil case with all of these special light, light colored highlighters. She's like, these are good for planners. So I have a lot of Holly related oh stuff, but this chart I made at overnight at her house where we chugged coffee and she has a great big table and she has a roll of like butcher's paper oh, that yeah? she can pull over. So she can fill the whole paper with butcher, the whole table with butcher's paper. And then she slams down like a jar of markers and crayons. And we literally made a giant chart and I talked through and we wrote it out of all like these character arcs uh and then I rolled it up and I took home this giant scroll which I then converted to what I'm curious what charts are behind here oh more of them I like a chart (laughs) as you can see this oh this is a box in the woods revision chart this is how like how I ended up finishing the book as I went through chapter by chapter and then like noted all the things I had to fix and I love a chart I like graph I like order you are in good company. This talk yeah. about different planners. Let's roll out this paper. Look at my different highlighters. I'm like, okay. Oh, well, like, yeah. wait a sec. Hold on. Let's go. Then let's go. <laughs> if we're going to do this, let's do it. <laughs> okay, first of all, this is the new planner I got obsessed with and then never used. I overnighted <laughs> it and, and spent extra money on it. But here's why it's great, and I'm Relatable. definitely going to use it in the fall, is because... It has this spread. I know you guys didn't come here for this, but it's big. It has this really long spread that you can do the whole month in. And then it has these flaps that you can do week by week, but you can see the whole month at once. Oh, That's what I really wanted is the ability to see the whole month at once. You guys, I could talk about this forever. And also just things like just (laughs) printing out. This is a new dossier mystery I'm working on that is a case book. So you literally get a case book of documents and photographs and then the solution is in the back. So this is actually being finished oh. this week. Um, and I'm illustrating it with my friend Jay Cooper because I did this little guidebook called Your Guide to Not Getting Murdered in a Quaint English Village. And he's doing oh the illustration. So that's done. That book's been out for a while. But um, this is – so these are documents. But, like, you get uh, – like, you get charts. You get, like – these are all clues. You go through the – you. This is real. This was just the rough draft. These are all, but yeah. So then you print it out. You know, got my highlighters, got my got my post its. I'm just saying, I never travel without this many pens. 
<laughs> and this many, this many post-its and highlighters. Oh my god, I love it. I me too. <laughs> if you just, sh if you just shake me, post-its fall out. Like it's, I have a lot of. I'm my my. I was supposed to be on tour for this book. Okay, I just got to complain for a second. Sure. I've had two book tours since COVID started. Mm -hmm. The first one was January last year, January 23. I went on tour and I immediately got COVID for the first time. First day out, I got COVID. I was one for one. Uh, and I got stuck in San Luis Obispo, California. Uh, I quarantined. I, I got it. I suddenly had a fever of 102. I was really sick. And I was like, I just stay in a hotel. And I was on... The, because I was on in Pismo Beach, I stayed in a beach hotel. I was tripping balls because I was so sick, but I just <laughs> opened the window. And so I had a balcony and I just breathed in beach air and laid in bed and watched surfers because you could see them from the window and just was like, Whoa. that was my first tour. Here we are. I'm like now t touring for death at morning house. Nothing can go wrong now. We just needed to, because my husband's English, we just needed to go to England and visit our relatives and everything was cool and I was ready to go because technically I should have been gone this whole last week. But then on, then on uh, Monday, got a little sniffle, hmm. oh. little sneeze. I'm like, oh, I'm just allergic. There's something in the air. <laughs> oh, now I have chills. Oh, now I'm nauseous. Oh, now I'm asleep. Hmm, what could it be? It's definitely not COVID. I was the only person masking in England. Oh, no. I got COVID again. No. And it right three days before my tour. So I had, or actually, no, I'm sorry. It was a week. It was a week before my tour. I, I'm, I don't know what day or time it is anymore. I've lost all sense of it. But it tanked the US tour. And I, it has been reassembled. And I am starting again this weekend. And I will be oh. doing half this U.S. tour and then going right to the U.K. to do a full U U.K. tour. And then I will come back and I will finish the U.S. tour. Well, the good oh news gosh. about you already having had COVID <laughs> is you'll be immune for a while. So you get to enjoy this time around. <laughs> Look, I'm not so egotistical. I don't believe that the universe is telling me. So, but at the same time, I'm like, OK, you're two for two. And two of those, by the way, have been Boulder, Colorado. Boulder, Colorado is like, you are oh. absolutely just against us. Shots like, fired. Boulder. Yeah, Boulder's <laughs> like, so I am going to Boulder this upcoming weekend. I will be on a plane on Saturday. I am going to be there, Boulder. Nothing can stop me now, she said, as a piano <laughs> fell on her from the sky. So... I feel like something's going to stop me. I'm, I'm going to be walking through the boulder to the get the plane and someone's going to just like jump on me Secret Service style and be like, no, you're not. You're going to feel the moment the air shifts in the plane like I'm in Boulder. Like you're just going to know. Like... Well, you fly to Denver and that is where my agent and best friend lives. So I'm just going to stay with her. Mm -hmm. But here's the thing, Boulder, Boulder bookstore. We may be bringing a puppy <gasps> because she just got a new Jack Russell puppy. He's Jealous. a little tiny guy, and he has two little hearts in his fur, so oh. they named him the Doctor, Aww. and they call him Doc. I love that. I had a Dalmatian, and he had a few heart spots, and they're just so sweet. Oh, Can you imagine if you so show dark. up? That will be the second time also that we have maybe shown up for a Colorado signing with a dog, because I've also done the Tattered Cover in Denver, and on the way, we were in the car, and there's a, there was a golden retriever just walking down the street alone. And we stopped the car, and we're like, what's happening? And so we got the dog, and he happily hopped into the trunk. And then we drove around. We couldn't find the owner, and we were calling, and nobody was answering. We're like, this golden retriever is coming to the bookstore with us. <laughs> so we were going to be like, it's us. And this golden retriever we found on the sidewalk. And then at the last second, the owner called and we were able to reunite them. So I might be the author that either doesn't show up in Colorado, but if she does, we'll bring a dog that she finds. <laughs> well, I mean, I'm not against ever, it. <laughs> would you ever write a animal companion for a sleuth in one sure. of your books? I will make this personal guarantee, though, <laughs> that an animal will never, ever be hurt or killed in one of my books. Thank because you. I, Thank you. <laughs> look, I know it's a little... I just can't personally can't write it and yeah. I'm just that person like I I can't even watch the secret life of pets because 
some of the pets are sad in it. I'm just, I'm like, these animated pets are sad. Yeah. Yeah. I am that much of a, of a, I can't watch John. I've watched John Wick, but I've started oh. it a half hour in. Yeah. That I've, I was told what happened and I just was like, yes. okay, it's not for me. I would me. be John Wick. Honestly, I would be him. I have no training. I'll get me some. I don't need Oh, it. yeah. I'm just a woman scorned. <laughs> okay. Oh, <laughs> like, you hurt my yeah. dog. Okay. Looks like I'm an assassin. Oh, I 100% understand <laughs> yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I can read some gory stuff. And as soon as it's about an animal, I'm like, this is the worst nope. thing ever. Nope. But like mm -mm. humans, I'm like, yeah, murder that guy. <laughs> Let me read you know, about it. It's fine. <laughs> I've thought about this and I'm like, it's, I think it's partially because we, okay, we are human. At least, you know, look, if you're not and you're listening, you know, um, <laughs> But whenever I see animals on shows, I'm like, they don't know they're acting. They don't, they're not acting. They're not, they don't know what TV is. They don't know what movies are. Mm -hmm. right. They're just being a good boy. Like they don't know. Yeah. And I'm always thinking about that is that they are, they are doing their own thing. They have no idea what a John Wick mm -hmm. is. They're just, they're just in, they're just getting treats and hanging out and they, you know, they don't know. So yeah. in many yeah. ways I'm like, it's, they, I, I don't want to involve them <laughs> in a bad way. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, agreed. <laughs> anyway, death at Morning House. Is that what I'm supposed to say? <laughs> I'm so bad at publicity. They're like, talk about your book. I'm like, do you want to hear about pens and dogs? Hey, that's okay. We we have a so-called book podcast, but we'll go off on tangents about like musical theater, about who knows what. And then I'm like, oh, yeah, so this book we read, <laughs> bringing it back, yeah. oh. you know? <laughs> Musical theater. Guess who knows whenever there is a regional production of Rent. That would be that would be this one right here. I love that. When when your name is Maureen Johnson, a name I had before Rent was Rent. Uh, yep. A question I got in the beginning. Are you named for her? Is she named for you? Are you oh her? God. Did are you, you cheat? Her? Wow. Oh, my God. And people. I am the Maureen Johnson who really does live near the 11th Street. I live in the East Village. So I live where this, like, yeah, I have been to the, it's not the Life Cafe anymore, but that, <laughs> that bar restaurant, I have yeah. been there. It's in my neighborhood. Wow. I feel, and I know Anthony, so I, I call him Pookie. Um, so I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, we're meant to be together, Pookie. <laughs> He's oh my, my Pookie. I always call him Pookie when I talk to him. I'm like, I get to call you Pookie. My name's Maureen Johnson. I'm just allowed. He accepts Does that. Does anyone ever call you Mojo? I got that as a kid. I never liked oh. it. I like oh, it, but uh, no, no, no. I'm okay with it now. But as a kid, I don't know why. As a kid, I was always like, don't call me that. You know how you're a kid and you just have an aversion to things that you can't quite explain? Yes. Yeah. Um, yes, <laughs> I just never got the because I think Mo in my head always sounded like a 50 year old guy with a cigar that ran a bar in Queens. Like, hey, there's yeah. Mo. But now I'm like, that sounds awesome. Call me Mo. I and let me be some guy <laughs> chomping a cigar, running a bar. Hey, Mo. What do you want to know? <laughs> sounds 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 great. Powerful. Yes. <laughs> so I wanted to ask. For so the settings of your book are so like oh my book right yeah <laughs> your book <laughs> don't worry there's plenty more time for us to get into tangents about other things great I can great, guarantee great. you the people listening to this just want to hear your thoughts about anything like great that, yes. it doesn't have to be just about death at morning house but this question is about death at morning house okay in truly devious the book took place in and around burlington vermont and the feeling of being on the mountain was super captivating like mm. i just the first couple chapters of that book i was like i am here and as i was reading nothing in my world existed other than that mm -hmm. book in mm -hmm. death at morning house the protagonist marlo wexler ends up on thousand islands in upstate new york what drew you to set the novel there this time? Like, what was intriguing about this area? So as a mystery writer, you have a job of, it's a really state, it has a lot, when I think about mysteries, they're very stage-like. You're really setting your characters on a stage. You're giving them a place they can't really move from because you need them 
to all have been in the same place and you sometimes kind of need to keep them there. That's why mysteries are always trying to contain characters in a setting. A remote house, a a mountain. I, I that the reason truly devious was set there was I needed to put them on a mountain. And so I I kind of look for the bit of geography or the location that seems right. And for that type of school, the history, everything, Vermont, Burlington turned to be out to be perfect. Uh, so I knew I wanted, I was, the island mysteries are classic. I wanted to think of a good island. And I remember hearing about the Thousand Island as a kid. My, I think my a, a postcard I saw at my aunt's house or something of these, all these little tiny islands. There are 1,800 islands in the St. Lawrence River, which is a huge river. And you can have an island with just one house on it. Like, it's wild. Like, you go there and it's literally just a house in the river with nothing. Like, you step out the front door and you have one foot and that's it. You don't go outside except in a boat. I don't know what you do, but you don't go outside. Um, so some of these are very small and some of these are bigger islands. And a lot of them were personally, like, they were purchased because this was a playground for the super rich. So they would purchase islands and build mansions on them and they would spend their summers there yachting from house to house. Um, they would do things like the poker race where you race from island to island and pick up cards or it was a bootleggers paradise because that's a point between Canada and the United States. So liquor would come down. So they'd have they'd race the police in these speedboats. They would dump their liquor in the river. Sometimes they dump it with salt. So when the salt dissolved, the liquor would rise and someone would come and pick it up. So it really is littered with liquor bottles, like old liquor bottles and history and police chases, and pirates and 5,000 shipwrecks. So it's, it's a good island setting. And you could keep them there because you can't, you know, you have, I thought a lot about how many, exactly how many yards from the shore this house would be. Is it swimmable? Is it, you, can you swim to another island? And in this case, I made it so you can't. This is, again, it's a shipping channel. You can swim in parts of it, but you can drown very, very easily swimming in it. Right. Mm -hmm. I loved hearing about all of the fun, like, Prohibition era factoids and tidbits. And sometimes I was like, this is too cool to be real. But it has to be real. Because it's real. Because that's how life works. Yeah. <laughs> it is actually like real. Yeah, that's it's that's wild. what I found out when I went up there. I, you know, I went on a bunch of tours and I met a teenage tour guide and I talked to her throughout. She was one of my contacts. And so you find out all these when you go when you do the boat tours, they tell you all about like, yes, the they would have these runners that would would go across the river at night in boats with the lights off or in they would dump the stuff overboard or they would leave it on an island and it would get picked up. Uh, so that a whole river crossing is full of old booze. Um, and it's really kind of romantic and fun. But from that, uh, from that tour guide, I was like, this is the coolest job ever. She's, it's just like, yeah, I live here. We jet ski to work. Like you go for, you have to get from island to island, like to do stuff. So you jet ski to get over there, to get to that, this house or this island. You either boat or you jet ski to get from place to place. It's amazing. And I was like, I need to move here because it also looks <laughs> tropical. The water is super pure. It's really clean and it glows green like tropical water. So there's parts where you look and these houses are all kind of candy colored and the water is tropical and people are just, bo I'm like, what am I doing wrong with my life? Like, why am I not here? <laughs> this is great. You got to get yourself an island, honestly. Yeah. <laughs> the only thing is, if there are, if you have a fire, that thing, there's a thing in there about a, a boat being called the Last Chance. That's real. Mm. That boat oh. is the fire boat is actually called the Last Chance, oh because God. if you have a fire on your island, they are your last chance. So that is not made up. That is real. Oh my wow. God! See, I don't swim, so I just that's not good. Uh, good juju for me. <laughs> I'm just gonna. <laughs> Yeah, I'm just yeah it, it, <laughs> if I'm you like... get on trouble on the island, you're close, so you can boat to the shore or another island, but you have to have a boat or some other means. Right. Yeah. And if there's a fire, that you have to get the fire boat. Oh, it God. was like always my dream to live on an island just like my home when I was a kid. And so <laughs> reading this book yeah. and like seeing the setting 
other than the creepy stained glass faces and everything, I was like, I could do this. But I wouldn't have a bunch of kids. It's, it would just be me. And every room would be like for a different hobby I have. Yeah. Yes. I mean, it's beautiful. But the thing is, you really are, you know, if you want to go to town and see people and get stuff, you have to take a boat. You yeah. want, if you need groceries, you have to take a boat. So in the winter, um, either you don't stay there or you have enough provisions in case you're iced in or there's a storm uh yeah, that they have ice they have things to cross in the ice but it's it's yeah. dicey in uh, on the off yeah. season and in, and you know if and again if there's a storm you you your beast you have to have a generator and enough provisions yeah Ooh. well nikki maybe i would visit you maybe i would <laughs> because i'm like this is too much for me. it is pretty it's real pretty yeah <laughs> i have to say even though some truly sad at times and some scary moments always happen in your books i always find them super cozy and for whatever reason even though people are dying i'm like oh, i love this i want to stay here you know like <laughs> but i'm also always trying to solve the mysteries alongside the protagonist and so usually not very successfully so kudos to you but do you like dropping these breadcrumbs for us and how do you find the right balance of like how much do I drop when? That's all the share a bit about that. Yeah, I mean mysteries are games. And so there are mysteries out there. There are types of mysteries that are not solvable. Like sometimes police procedurals aren't solvable by the reader mm -hmm. because you're just following the police as they collect evidence or find things. Um a classic uh what's called a fair play mystery, which is this what what this is, means that it can be solved by the reader given the, the information in the book you don't need external information uh and you don't and you know for example uh it might turn up in a in a certain type of mystery that you haven't met the murderer you know you it's dna and you find the person in these kind of mysteries in fair play the the people responsible are always there in the group in the setting and it's up to you the reader with the information given to figure it out it's a game it's a puzzle I always start writing mysteries from why. Always. I sit and think about why. Because it's a serious thing. Even though it's 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 a... mystery. Murder mysteries are weirdly fun. But they are gruesome. And you have to really know why this happened. And then I pull out the who and the how. And I write the end. I have... I figure out all the technical aspects of it. And why... And how everybody relates to what goes on. And from there, I can start pulling threads and working backwards. Okay, okay, here's how this person, this is why this person wouldn't talk about this. This is why this other person wouldn't have noticed this. This is why this other person is ignoring this, etc. And then I kind of pull towards the front. Oh, right. interesting. That's kind of like the opposite of how you write other genre fiction, I feel like, in a way. Because well, I, yeah. I, I often write the end. I, I've never written a book in order. Ever. Oh, interesting. Ever. Cool. I've never written anything in order. I've never written an essay in order. I've never written... I write bits of it, like that. my kind of core sentiments or ideas that I have. Um, luckily now, I used to always just do it in, in Word, but I use Scrivener, mm -hmm. which is a, a program used by a lot of writers. And it's very simple, but it's that you can make individual files for things. So I can write a, a scene file and you can move them up and down. And you can combine them. And that's a great tool if you write like me and you, you are writing in different sections that you sometimes need to reorder or label because some of this takes place in the past, some of it's in the present. So I can see by marking like where I'm putting in my past sections and sometimes I can move them up and down like, oh, okay, actually I want it between chapter 16 and 17 and not where I have it. Right, so. okay. Yeah, not all of us have a butcher block roll. <laughs> Put your paper I, roll on our table. I wish. Holly Black. <laughs> uh, I, Scrivener's a great program. It's it almost, yeah, I would say most writers I know that I hang out with use it. Uh, and then you just export it as a document. Um, but it just, it's very simple, but it allows you to write sections, group things, and chapters, and scenes, and things like that. Yeah, That's I haven't cool. used Scrivener, but I've used, I've dabbled in Dabble, which is another kind of like writing tool <laughs> like that. And I love it because it has the kind of 
cue card layout that people like mm-hmm. to use sometimes yeah. so instead of having it on a big white board or on a cork board you have it actually like on your program and it is so nice for organizing and everything yeah that's super cool it, i don't get into the really because it has a billion technical settings you can do tags and set in like there's you can if you want you can drill this thing into the ground i never get into all of that I just basically use it to write things in sections and then I, I'll label them occasionally a color, but that's it. I don't do all of the, you can do things where you label exactly what characters show up in what scenes and then you can sort by character and you can sort, like you can do all of that. And right. uh, that's, uh, it's one step too fussy for me, mm-hmm. um, but I like to keep it divided and then be able to do my sections. For sure. I move my hands a lot. I'm always like, and <laughs> this okay. moves here and this. <laughs> I'm too close to see my hands. I got to bring them up. Yeah, <laughs> so, like this. <laughs> sure. I'm going to skip around a little bit. Is Wexler yes. a call to turtle? Okay. I knew it. <laughs> I'm going to tell you guys a secret. I'm going to tell I you guys a secret. I the Western game when I was a kid. <laughs> I was, I don't, I've never told this. I'm not sure if I, I, I never signed an NDA or anything, but I was offered the job of writing the sequel. Oh, oh, we need a, a long time ago. No, it never came to pass for like complicated reasons. Like it right. just and it, I thought about it and I declined mm. because mm. I was like, this is it shouldn't be. I don't I don't know. I've never I have I have feelings about when a seri- like when books are taken over by other writers. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't I don't know, like I get it, but I don't love it. Yeah. And I was, but I was like, that is a higher compliment has never, ever been paid to me than that. Like it's, yeah. So I, I was actually offered that job at one point oh and gosh. I was like, and I never get to talk about it, but I was like, I'm like, I'm just going to say it. And I was like, this is, yeah. I yeah, mean, that, that, girls here. <laughs> that, that would have been, a, yeah, but I was like, mm, it, shouldn't, it shouldn't happen. Let yeah. it be. I, yeah, I literally, we had written down for like later in the questions, I'm a huge fan of Ellen Raskin's The Westing Game. Mm. Huge. I read it when I was in grade four for the first time. And I've read it so many times since. And I get it. Like the ending of that book is so like all encompassing and poignant. And like, there are so many ways that you could derail that by making a sequel and I just I'm so happy <laughs> that that you like named Marlo Wexler because yep I saw that on the I don't know if I saw it in the cover or like when she's introducing herself in the book and I was like oh, the Western game and I knew immediately that I was gonna love this book <laughs> I I consider her a distant relative of turtle yes <laughs> I haven't read it yet, so I'm like, oh, like I don't want to know. I don't want to know. So I'm glad you're gonna it's love it. Spoiler free. Oh, I'm excited because I know good. Nikki and I have similar tastes, and I love mystery books. And we grew up reading different mysteries, so it's like super fun. We can share them with each other. So I'm like, it's on my list. I gotta get to it. <laughs> it really, it's it. Yeah, it's it. It's very. It's so well structured, um, and it holds up in terms of like. It's from 1978, but it holds up in terms of diversity or holds up in terms of just like there's stuff about it where you don't read. It's sometimes you go back and you read stuff and you're like, ah, yeesh, oof, oh, <laughs> yeah. um, and the Westing game is really not like that. And it's really just about people in this that live in this in this uh, this big building, um, Sunset Towers. And uh, I don't know. I don't want to spoil it for you, but it's so good. Yeah. I'm going to circle back to a previous part of our conversation because I want to get more info on your dual timeline stories that you love to do, which we love to read. I am super curious, and I think we kind of got a bit of the answer, but I want to hear more about, do you write the two timelines separately, like all in one go, and then piece them together, or do you write them in tandem? Yeah. Uh, they, they kind of get written up because I don't write anything in order. They get, they, they're, they're weirdly easier to write than the present day pieces for me. They're always oh. easier. I don't know why, but they're always easier. 
Um, and uh, sometimes I have to figure out how to break them and divide them. So sometimes I write a big chunk of it and then I'm like, actually, this is one section. This is one section because they're reveals they're there. You just get these glimpses. You get to, it's really selective when you get to look back and see what happened in 1932. So it's a, it's a bit of a balance because I'm trying to describe and give a full mystery of deaths in 1932 while doing a whole set of discoveries in the present of what happened. And I try to do these dual solves where you find out what happened in the past and what happened in the present. Right. Mm -hmm. So um, it's a lot of tweaking and measuring. Okay, right. yeah. And I found at the end of this book, I won't say because I'm going to keep it spoiler free. There was a section at the very end that made me very, very sad. I'm sure you know what it is. <laughs> is it a letter? Yes. And I was like, even though people died, I felt like that was the true tragedy of the book. That was my favorite yeah. part to write. It was so sweet and sad and romantic and just just so many things in one. I was like, why? Why? At the very end. When I'm like, we're going to calm down now. No, we're not going to calm down. It did feel so, when I was getting to the end, I'm like, stuff is happening now. Yeah. 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 I was like, this is a whole other book. You know, like, I'm ready, honestly. <laughs> just saying but <laughs> a lot a lot went down yeah and we just got yeah. a little snippet of it so surprise <laughs> there are surprises at the end so many oh and they're gosh. all great like awful <laughs> but great <laughs> there's a lot of really awful stuff that happens in here yeah oh yeah <laughs> and we loved it <laughs> a lot of terrible things happen but not to animals, so... No, no in fact, cool. there is a cat in the book where I thought, oh, are they going to have to be mean to this cat? And I was like, what if I turn it around and make it so that the cat gets rescued and lives the most awesome life ever with a rich person <laughs> who poaches salmon for it twice a day? Like, I'll do that. Yeah, yeah. So that is literally what I did because I cannot... I just can't. It's just a thing. I can't do it. If there's I couldn't write option. it. Make the animals royalty at the end. Yes. Just, <laughs> oh my God. Yes. I just, yeah. I can't, I can't do the, uh, you know, obviously I don't do Bambi. I don't do any of the, you know, I don't do those things. No. Yeah. yeah no. No. <laughs> never again. Saw it once. Never again. My children will not be subjected to that. <laughs> no. <laughs> like, no. I can't. So I get it. <laughs> so in both Truly Devious and Death at Morning House, the second plot line that's woven through takes place during the Prohibition era. Can you tell us a little bit more about your like fascination with the time period? And would you consider writing more books with dual timelines in other periods? I know Box in the Woods has a 70s, mm -hmm. I believe, timeline. But yep, like, are there other areas or periods you're wanting to explore? So there's Nine Liars, which came after Box in the Woods. That Nine Liars is the most recent Stevie Bell. And that that past mystery takes place in 1995. Oh, yes. So much yes, more it recent. Uh, it has a lot of it. And it happens. It takes place in England. It has a lot of Brit pop in it. Um, it was so fun. It's a yeah. I mean, I think that you look back for periods that feel rich to you, like things that you are personally drawn to. Um, I, I've, I've wondered, I'm like, why do I keep using these dual timelines? But then it kind of occurred to me that mysteries are, are about history. History and mysteries are, are linked. They're all about looking back and trying to reassemble what happened and pick through the pieces and try to figure out how we got to where we are. And it kind of doesn't matter if you're trying to reassemble a, a broken pot to try to put together the miss the the myth that's depicted on it and why it was used and how it was used or you're trying to figure out how the body got here like we're always just trying to figure out how we got to where we are right mm -hmm. um and what was it like before and how did it lead to now mm -hmm. um and mysteries are just about going back and trying to reassemble so yeah i and i I'll, i mean what death at morning house is about in a broader sense is 
literally some parts of American history that we try to ignore. Um, like I said, and like the eugenics tense and things like that. Like these, these things have consequences. And when you try to block out and say, and just say, oh, I'm not going to teach it. We don't want to talk about it. it then you get to the people that say it didn't happen. Yeah. Because we don't talk about it, ergo, it didn't happen. Right. Uh, is a very, very dangerous way of thinking. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I, I don't know. I just have always been drawn to these things. Uh, I get very caught up in them. Say what I love about the dual timelines in your books is even though, I mean, I was just born in 1995. But like mm -hmm. the 90s, I was kind of like not super like coherent of what was going on. And reading about the 70s or the 30s, even the 90s, makes me like nostalgic for a time that I wasn't even alive, which is yeah. like mm -hmm. so special. And I mean, obviously, there are like horrible things that are happening in these books and crimes, but it's the essence of the time period and truly devious when they're talking on the rotary phones or the music that's being that they talk about playing in Nine Liars, the the like structure of the house and what everybody was doing in Death at Morning House, it makes you really nostalgic and feel like you are actually like living in this time period. And then you also get to relate to people that are doing things in the time where you currently reside. And it just gives you everything to have those two time periods happening simultaneously. I will say that now, since Nine Liars came out, the movie Saltburn came out, and I feel like they are, like, I'm like, did you like Saltburn? <laughs> Would you like a <laughs> slightly YA version of Saltburn? <laughs> Man, I love Saltburn. Yeah, I did too. <laughs> I, I saw it, it on a plane. So I think they cut out some super gross scenes, which was perfect. Like I heard there were some oh. really gross scenes. And it, they, I yeah. think they toned them back for the plane. There were definitely um, some like scenes you don't want the person sitting next to you on a plane to look over and see you watching. Or maybe yeah, you know, depending on who's beside you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Man, I loved it. I loved it so much. Oh my gosh. I think we have to wrap up soon, unfortunately, because we don't want to take up too much I of your know. time. I know you have other interviews. Don't you want to see more planners? I do, of course. honestly. <laughs> but I guess if I could end on one little question, um, do you think there's any future Marlo Wexler books? That no, this, about? this no? is meant to be okay. a one and done, but Stevie Six is already begun. Oh, thank goodness. Okay. Stevie Six <laughs> yeah. and Stevie Seven, plus the dossier. Like, there's a lot to write. So yeah, people are always like, what are you writing? And what are you doing? I'm like, I just... They're like, what do you do? What do you do all day? What are you doing in there? You're like, yeah, I just sit at my desk. There's a lot of sitting involved. <laughs> That's okay, because you have a lot of stationery <laughs> yeah. to keep you company. <laughs> yes. Although I will say a lot of writing is like, because people are like, how long have you been doing? Like I clean up the kitchen and I fiddle around, but that's sort of what I'm thinking. Mm -hmm. um, right. I like to give, let me paint something. Oh, I can paint something all day and like just a, a job where you can just do something repetitively and think is perfect. Mm -hmm. for, you know, if I had a lawn, I'd be mowing it constantly. Like, oh, just... <laughs> Except I wouldn't because I like to rewild lawns so that uh, butterflies will come. But you know what I'm saying? Like a nice repetitive oh, yeah. sweeping, vacuuming, like anything where you can just kind of be like, mm, just kind of go into a zone. Right. So I feel like I need to start writing more uh so i can clean my house more is what you're saying to oh me. <laughs> well that's the other thing is like when you are avoiding writing you're like well obviously i have to i have to bleach my doorknobs like it's just <laughs> always you just get into some weird task where you're like but i need to repolish everything don't you understand the knobs of the stove i need to totally re oh, i must clean this yeah you know, just yeah if you know if you've seen that i've pulled out the fridge then you know that they're <laughs> that's they every ollie on the way <laughs> that's every writer though that's that's every, uh, you know you will suddenly find that somebody is like just do you know that's that's a classic thing i i i, I lived in this crappy old apartment in queens where you could do anything to this apartment and it didn't matter and I repainted that thing so many times. I can't even tell you. I once in the middle of the night, I ripped out the kitchen floor with my bare hands. I just like 
this gross linoleum floor is gone. And I just pulled it up. And then I went to Home Depot and got like new floor tiles and put them down because I was like, I'm on book deadline. Time to take up the floor. <laughs> Honestly, I have a lot of procrastination issues and that really resonates with me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, do one yeah, productive I, thing um, to avoid the productive thing you're actually supposed to be doing. Oh, Look, yeah. I have a chapter right, but have you seen my new steamer? <laughs> I did buy a steamer so I could like steam all the corners of things, but then it got recalled because every time I used it, it did burn me. And then it turned out I had a national recall. So I was like, maybe I'm not going to steam things. So that's oh, my no. steamer story. Because. Yeah. You have to return it because they're like, you have to cut the cord off and return it because it, I was like, yeah, this thing has burned me every time. <laughs> Wild. Yeah. Oh my gosh. <laughs> On that note, but the morning house. That note. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us today, Maureen. This has been a blast hearing all of your stories and having you answer all of our questions that we have been dying to get answers to for years at this thank point. Thank you so much. <laughs> and thank you all for listening. If you'd like to keep up with Maureen and her goings on, you can go to her website, MaureenJohnsonBooks.com or Instagram at MaureenJohnsonBooks. If you'd like to keep up to date with us, you can follow us on Instagram at BYO Book Podcast or on TikTok at Bring Your Own Book Podcast. And remember, if you want to read a mystery, pick up a Maureen Johnson book. Until next time, yeah. see ya!